Our Old Testament reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 35. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong and fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson is taken from James chapter 2. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have decided the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can the faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go, in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. <clears throat> show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thank you, Jesus, God. We rise for the gospel reading. Our gospel lesson is taken from Mark chapter 7. Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee to the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hands on him, and taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to, them, to him, Ephatha, that is, be open. And his ears were open, his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute speak. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love to have your face shine on your house, and in the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it.
Savior Jesus Christ. Please be seated. I am not going to confuse you today. It's going to be a very simple message. I know sometimes I get accused of going too deep and then you tell me what that message was all about. God is very deep. The mystery of God is, for the most part, unattainable by us human beings, but the gospel also has a purity, a simplicity that we can grasp onto, and that simplicity of God shows us his love, and it's about how he contacts you. It's about a personal contact with you. And that's the driving force of our gospel lesson. But I'm going to start with our Old Testament lesson because the Old Testament lesson is a proclamation. And it's very interesting when you think about the Word of God as it gets proclaimed throughout the ages. And then within those times, within or through that vast period of time, uh, you have moments of contact. And that's how life is. And if you look at the beginning of the Isaiah text, Isaiah is saying, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious in your life, in your life span, so to speak. And I think he says that to you because he knows you are what? You're anxious throughout your days. There's times you don't go to sleep very well because you're worried about something, something usually that's out of your control, and you have anxiety. And that's kind of a common situation that we find ourselves. And then there are moments of contact, moments in time, in history, where things get declared, where things get promised, where things get finalized. For instance, you are a young man and you're looking for a wife and you find this beautiful girl and you fall in love and then you ask her to marry you and she says yes. And then you've got that period of time, right, Nathan? Of course. You've got that period of time that goes by. And then there becomes that moment in time where the pastor's going to say, I now pronounce you man and wife. And everybody says, it's done in that moment. And all the planning and all that stuff, all the anxiety, all comes to the point, and now it's done. In a funeral, we have funerals. We have that day where we have a funeral. And we, we look at a life that has been born and now dies. And all the best time in between. And all the anxiety. And all of the complications. And all the worries. High points, low points of the life. And then there's the death. And then we go to the committal service. And there's a finality when we say, We now commit this body. Created by God. Redeemed by God. By the blood of Christ and baptized, sanctified by baptism, and we're waiting for the resurrection. See? Um, graduation. Go to school, go through all your studying, year after year, and then there's that point, you're handed the diploma in a ceremony. You ever have a revelation, and you can still look back in your life, and you know before that revelation, that, that aha moment, and you still remember that moment where before that moment you really didn't understand something, but then something happened in an instant in time in history and what? Aha! Now I understand. And you remember those times. Those times within history. That's what it's like. That's what God does. And when you have the Isaiah text, he's saying salvation is going to come. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, don't fear. Why? Because you are fearing and you're going through this tumult of life. Why? Because he's coming and he will come and he will save you. It's going to happen and it's going to be a point of contact. It's going to be a point in contact. All right? That's very important to understand. Look at uh, Eve. We, the seventh graders, we're going through Genesis, and we're just getting started over there. And we went through um, where uh, Adam and Eve disobeyed, and they fell into sin. And amongst all the judgments that God said is now going to happen, life is going to be rough. In the midst of it, he gives you the chapter 3, verse 15. There will come one, he says to Satan, uh, there will come one from the woman, from the woman, from her offspring will come one, and he's going to crush your head. 
Your head will be crushed, Satan. Check me. And Eve, then it talks about the story of Cain and Abel, the firstborn son to Eve is Cain. And you can tell that when Cain has the firstborn son, she says, here it is. And thinking that it's the savior, it's not. It's the first murderer in human recording. And what's going to happen is from Eve is going to be this long span of time, long, long span of time, where there is a call of Abraham, where the people are called, where this nation is going to get built, and time is going to go by, we're going to go through slavery to 400 years, we're going to be taken out of it, and there's going to be the whole time of the kings, and all these stories, all that span of time between Cain and finally the virgin-born Christ. And there's that moment of time with the Incarnation. Throughout this long history, you see what I'm getting at? Think of all the anxiety of humanity throughout that time. And then the moment of the Incarnation. The moment of the Crucifixion. The moment of contact. And this is where we get to the Gospel lesson today. And the main thing, in fact, I can't find much of anything else in this part of Scripture as I look and I study it. You know, maybe somebody let me know. But it's this, the theme there, when Mark talks about what happens to this deaf and mute man, it has everything to do with a personal contact. Because the way Mark writes it is what? He, first of all, takes this guy aside from the crowd when a group in the crowd said, hey, there's this guy who needs your help. He needs your healing. And what does Jesus do? He didn't do this grandiose. He took him aside privately, away from the crowd. And then, of course, because he's deaf and not able to speak, he touches him, but it's very interesting what happens. And here, when you look at the original language, it's, it's like this. He takes... He's, he's like, he spits, and it's probably on his tongue, and he grab, it sounds like he grabs the man like this, putting these fingers in his ears and these thumbs at his mouth, and he's speaking to him personally. And he heals him. It's a personal contact. A moment he'll never forget. A moment in history where not only does he forget, but he's going to remember the whole history before that, but he could not hear or speak. And then, of course, then Jesus says, don't tell anybody. Well, they don't follow those directions, and they all tell because it's so fantastic. It's a personal connection. God does that with you. It says, says, okay, here's the Emmanuel Lutheran Church, here's the 8 o'clock service, and there's a fine group of people listening to me right now. And this salvation is for all of you, as Isaiah proclaims. He's coming and is proclaimed to the world in history, over time. Don't be anxious, even though you're anxious. And then it's like this. The Gospel lesson said, he's for you. Just you. Just you. Just you. He's only for you. He's there for you. As if you were the only one that's being saved. I'm sure that's how this man felt. As if he was the only one being saved. There's this personal contact between God and you. He doesn't wave the magic wand and sprinkle the dust across the earth. He comes for you. Like the good shepherd. Think of it that way too. He comes for you. Only you. Only you. Only you. Back row. Over there. Yep, you. And you. Yep, you. He comes for you. See how that works? He came for this man. And he gave him what he needed. That's what this text is saying. He comes for me. Jesus' actions communicate to this man and to us that he's known you from eternity. He's known you before the world was even created. You. Then he comes to save you. 
And if you're anything like me, it makes you feel kind of small and it makes you feel kind of special because there's those moments of time, right? And what is your first thought? I thought is when I was baptized. There was that moment of time as baptism is proclaimed, go ye now therefore and what? Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is the call, like Isaiah, here it is, baptism is available, and then it happens to me, water is applied, and the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is applied to me. You. That works. Why it needs to be means of grace. Why that's so important. Same with communion, right? And that makes me again feel special and it makes me wonder because if I look at myself and if you look at yourself, what do you find? You should probably ask the question, why does he come after me? Why am I special? I didn't do so good last week. In fact, I'm the one who has the anxiety. I'm the one who does not trust in the Lord. Why does he come for me? Because love has no bounds from God. God the Son came for you because he knows you, he knew you, and he'll always know you. And the second question becomes what? How can he do this to me? If you think about in the Old Testament even, they understood that when Isaiah, the same guy who proclaims that the Savior's coming, when he was called to be a prophet, Remember what he said? Woe is me. Don't call me. I'm an unclean man with unclean lips, living amongst the people with unclean lips. And then there's that part where God understands who you are and how far away you are in your sinful condition. He takes the seraph and what happens? He's cleansed. He's atoned for. And that, and only that, allows Isaiah to proclaim the Savior's coming. And that's the same with you. How does this mighty God come for you? He comes in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why he says, I descend to you, and I must what? Reascend. When my job is done, and think about the ascension, think about the incarnation. So in between them, this whole thing, when the proclamation happens, it happens in a moment. The incarnation. God the Son is now a human being who can touch a man who is deaf, spin on his fingers, and tell him, you are healed. Because now he's in human flesh, and because he's become human, he's become humbled. To the point where he who knew no sin, what? Became sin for us. As he enters into humanity, he takes on the guilt of humanity to the point he becomes sin as if I have never sinned in my life. And that's how he makes contact with me. It's awesome. It's awesome. So I want you to think of this one man, this deaf man, who can't speak. And think about that moment of contact. That's how he saved you. And he continues to save you. In moments in time as you go through this world. And he promises you in those moments of contact. So that you can survive the rest of the world. Where you move into anxiety. No one can snatch you out of my hand. I have claimed you. And it's even found where? In a moment in time. And I continue to have my eyes on you, even when you don't have your eyes on me. And when it seems like a long time coming, and it seems like you're like that guy, the man in the crowd who feels so alone, understand you're not alone. Because the God of love has claimed you. Now think of another moment that's coming that I personally just can't wait for. The moment he comes for you. When your anxiety is really high because you are dying. And then you take your last breath. In that moment, that personal contact, when Christ brings you home. And in that moment of resurrection, 
when my body is raised like Christ, in that moment after waiting so long as one human being in a history of human beings that have waited so long, we will step into eternity. It'll happen in a moment, anxious one. So be calm, be resolute. The Savior comes in a moment. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all of our human understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated.